Welcome to the Vidal and welcome to our ESG conference and the roundtable on sustainable investing. My name is Stefan Meyer. I'm the CEO of Open Funds. For those of you who do not know Open Funds very well, we're a distributor for a number of fund partners here in Switzerland. So we are basically their sales force in the Swiss market. We also act as a legal rep for about 150 funds, doing the job, communicating with FINMA, uh, having the proper documentation on the funds. And last but not least, we also have the opportunity um, to do private label funds with partners in Liechtenstein. So if that's something you're interested in, come talk to us. Um, as some of our partners have a distinct ESG strategy that they've integrated in their investment strategy, we thought it's a good idea to bring them together in a panel discussion with ESG experts so that you can learn about what do they do in the world of ESG, how do they integrate ESG topics into their investment strategy, and we also want them to be challenged by people who have a deep background in ESG investing, our ESG experts. But Timo, the moderator of the panel, will talk more about this when he introduces the panel. Let me now um, turn to introducing our keynote speaker, Nicole Streuli from Reprisk. Nicole is a co-founder and executive vice president of operations and research at Reprisk. Having joined the company in 2007, Nicole now directs the global analyst team and leads three departments, the ESG research, the research technology, and the business information research. She's also responsible for the development of Reprisk's global operations with subsidiaries in Berlin, in Manila, in New York, and in Toronto. And allow me a few words on Reprisk. They are in the ESG data science business. Unlike traditional ESG rating agencies, Reprisk's main business is not to provide ESG ratings, but to systematically identify and assess material ESG risks, delivering granular data through the platform and data feeds. They have a clear policy of analyzing public source information and intentionally exclude what companies publish themselves. Since 2007, Reprisk has gathered an immense volume of data that allows it to train its machine learning algorithms to be more accurate and effective in identifying ESG risks. Nicole is going to speak to us about the topic ESG data, challenges and opportunities, and she will talk about the challenges of data analysis, especially as she calls it, aggregated confusion, i.e. why do different data providers come to different results? And why is it important to know the motivation if a fund manager decides to integrate ESG into his strategy? Thank you very much, Stefan. Good morning, everyone. As Stefan just mentioned, I will be talking about ESG data challenges and opportunities today. And before I do so, I would like to have a show of hands who in the audience thinks that there are currently more challenges than opportunities in the ESG space. That's a good handful. <laughs> Let's see whether the event today can change this. I will be talking about two things, about the motivation for doing ESG, and if you know why you want to do it, how you can do it. And here, obviously, data is at the very core of, um, of how you do ESG. Let me go back 15 years. That's when I started off in the ESG industry. And ESG was not a thing then. The acronym was not really known. And the few data providers that decided they would devise a methodology to, um, to uh, come up with a data set that uh, complements the traditional financial um, assessments, did that based on conversations with the clients, and the, they saw a need to have uh, company ratings more um, comprehensively seen. Think about building a house in the 
rural countryside in Switzerland 300 years ago. No regulations, no one tells you how you have to build your house. And that's how the first ESG rating providers started their business. They did to the best of their knowledge. And uh, as in Switzerland today, you can't build a house just deciding however you want to build it. You're told which color your roof should have, which shade of red, what wood you, to use, where you get your electricity from. Now we see that the, um, there is a need for more standardization and regulation in a market. And I'll come to that a little bit later. But let me start with the why. Why have so many investors decided to integrate ESG? There are typically three main motivations for doing ESG. It's the values-based approach, the materiality-driven approach, and the impact approach. Values-driven approach is, uh, is done if an investor is not comfortable with certain industries or certain business practices. That uh, could be not comfortable with having pornography or tobacco in your portfolio. Could also be that you're not comfortable having a company in your portfolio that is associated with slave labor or corruption. The materiality-driven approach seeks to outperform. And it's assumed that by integrating data that gives a more complete picture on a company's operations, this can be done more comprehensively. I think about ESG as a proxy for operational risk more generally. I think if a company is associated with all kinds of nasty things, whether it's child labor or destroying the Amazonian rainforest uh, to a large extent, whether it's uh, child labor or forced labor, the likelihood that everything else is running smooth, all the operations, I deem very low. So I think, um, in general, seeing ESG as a proxy is at the heart of the materiality-based approach. Understanding that the risk uh, uh, in a company more, more comprehensively and um, by doing so, also reducing volatility in your funds. The third driver is impact. You want to have an impact with your investments. You believe in certain industri industries, for example. You believe in, in certain um, uh, uh, approaches. So maybe you want to have a fund that is um, favoring women in leadership. Maybe you want to have a fund that is um, focusing on bi biotechnology. So impact is the third motivator. So I repeat, so we have three motivators for doing ESG, the values-driven approach, the materiality-driven approach, and the impact-driven approach. And no one can decide for you what is the right one for you. So if you want to do ESG, be very clear why you want to do it. Do you want to do it because everyone else is doing it? Do you want to do it because your clients demand it? Do you have these values that just uh, drive you to having certain investments not in your portfolio? That's a question that no one can answer for you. But if you have the answer, the next question is how can you do it? And that leads me to the data pain points. Because if you want to do it, you need data to substantiate uh, your, your assessments. And within the ESG data, we have four common pain points. And these pain points are coverage, timeliness, transparency, and reliability. Coverage means that if you are invested, if, you, if you're interested in companies in sub-Saharan Africa, you need a provider that gives you information exactly on these companies. If you want to have information on frontier markets, then 
You need to have a, a provider that has exactly that kind of information. Depending on your strategy, you might need data more or less timely. Maybe the, um, the information that is issued once a year coming out of the corporate sustainability reports issued by companies themselves is not good enough. Maybe you want more granular, more updated data. The third pain point is transparency. How are these ratings put together in the first place? What makes the rating? And you want to understand the methodology. You want to see whether this has changed over time. You want to understand how this rating that recommends you to exclude or include certain companies has been put together. The fourth pain point is the reliability. And I said that before, I'm very critical about the data that is based exclusively on self-disclosure. I do think that there are certain aspects in, that, that are important for ESG that you won't find in the self-disclosed data that companies provide. So you want to have an outside in view to really make sure that you have a comprehensive view on how, the, how this company fares in ESG matters. So I repeat, we have the four data challenges within data sets, coverage, timeliness, transparency, and reliability. And as if this wasn't enough, there are more problems. The, one of the biggest confusions in the space is that there are no correlations between the different providers that are out there. Different providers come to different conclusions. I brought a picture for you. And I want you to think about how, how would you rate this picture? Scale one to five. And obviously, you have to ask yourself, by what should I rate it? Do I rate it by how colorful it is, or by the level of detail, or what is important to me? So the same thing applies to your ESG data providers. You need to know what is important to you in order to make the decision which provider you, you trust, which provider is the right one for your strategy. And unfortunately, there's some homework involved because you need to dig a little bit deep. You, first, you need to understand why you want to do it, and then you need to understand what is it exactly that I need to, to deliver the results that I want. The good news is there are a lot of people out there, a lot of companies that want to help you with this, doing your homework. Repress is one of them. And uh, if you do that well, I think nasty things like greenwashing can be avoided. Greenwashing, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, faces a lot of scrutiny as the in investments in the sustainability field have increased. Everyone wants to put a green label on it. But be very conscious about whether you really should do this or not. So again, going back to, to the, the data pain points, the, the pain points within the data, the pain points across data, important is that you know why and how you want to do it. And if it's done well, I personally believe that there are a lot of opportunities. We'll hear soon from the panel. And uh, the, these opportunities will also go back to the motivators. Maybe you also get a sense of fulfilling because you, you feel in line with your values. Maybe you see that the returns are much more stable, less volatile, by, by um, including a more comprehensive set of considerations. And with this, I'll hand it over back to Ste Stefan. And I'm very curious to hear what the panel uh, will, will bring us in this regard.
Thank you, Nicole. I think there's a lot of uh, material for the panel to discuss. Before I hand over to Timo, let me just quickly introduce our moderator for the panel. Timo Busch, he's a lecturer at the Department of Management, Technology and Economics of the ETH Zurich, and he holds a position as full professor of management and environmental sustainability at the University of Hamburg. His research centers on sustainable finance and investment. Since five years, he has co-authored the Swiss Market Report for Sustainable Investments together with Sustainable Finance. For the DACH re region, he and his research team are responsible for conducting the audit that allows SRI funds to carry the label Forum Nachhaltige Geldanlagen. And one last word. Um, when you came in, you got this in a little bag. There is um, true to ESG, no paper, so it's a little USB stick. You will find there all of uh, the presentations from our partners, from the fund managers, and you also find um, some information on open funds. Now with this, I hand it over to Timo for an interesting panel discussion. Yeah, um, thank you, Stefan. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm, uh, Glad to be here um, today and uh, moderate the session. Um, for me, it's kind of being back a little bit, being back home. I lived 10 years in, um, in Zurich, and uh, for the last eight years, I'm, I'm way in the north in Hamburg. Uh, yeah, it's not the best weather there, uh, that's true. Uh, but I experienced also it can be quite rainy um, down here, at least yesterday. <laughs> um, yeah, so my role is... Um, I, I, I personally would consider myself to, a little bit to be neutral, so I'm not offering any investment products. Uh, and uh, frankly speaking, I'm also not a huge investor. Uh, so uh, therefore, um, I'm, I'm in a neutral position. I can ask the asset managers, what do you offer? I have an opinion about that. I can hand over to experts and ask critically, uh, critically reflect on that. I can hand over also to investors to say, is that convincing? So and that's basically going to be my role um, here today. And of course, I would like to invite everyone in the room also to raise your questions and uh, your concerns uh, and whatever comes to mind. Um, yeah, so I thought about um, we start with the asset managers uh, on the stage. Um, and I quickly would like to introduce each and then ask the four of you to maybe wrap up in, let's say, I don't know, four or five sentences. What is your uh, fund's interpretation, understanding of ESG? Because what we just heard from Nicole is apparently there is a um, huge var uh, variation in what a fund can interpret in terms of ESG. You know, remember the picture, you know, is it the color, is it, is it the size, is it uh, the accuracy of the picture? So uh, we, a lot of things can be looked into when you, uh, when you ask the question, what is the sustainability considerations within the fund? So and that is maybe as a uh, first round so that everybody understands what, what your strategies are and what your, what your, your objectives are, right? Um, and maybe, yeah... Alex, shall, shall we start with you? So um, Alex Steven uh, is from Osmosis, uh, and uh, you will explain now uh, uh, specifically what your fund is about, please. Thank you, Timo, uh, and good morning, everyone. I'm Alex Steven, a, a portfolio execution manager at Osmosis Investment Management. We are a, a research-based quantitative asset manager. We invest in global equities, um, and the data availability as it is, we've just mentioned data, is not brilliant in, um, in sort of deeper equity markets. So we invest predominantly in um, developed in the large and mid-cap of the market. Um, the business was founded 13 years ago as, you know, with sustainability at its absolute core. And sustainability is our one investment driver. So it's our only signal in the fund. We have um, a very simple concept to the business, which is that uh, companies that generate more revenue from less resources will outperform their peers in the long run. And that is statistically proven by our research and independent research. Um, 
We call this the resource efficient factor that we create. And uh, resource efficiency to us means carbon emitted, water utilized, and waste generated by companies. And that is relative to the economic value created by those companies. And this allows us to objectively measure um, those companies that are really monetizing sustainability to their balance sheets, those best users of the resources that, that they have available to them. And it cuts through a lot of the ambiguity in many investment products at the minute, sustainable investment products, by directly linking um, the, the sustainable argument with an objective and verifiable and robust, uh, robust manner. The advantages to this are that our clients can expect to outperform over the long term, but in addition to that, they also get a significant reduction of their footprint, their carbon footprint. So in a typical MSCI world type basket, we see a carbon footprint reduction of 50 to 70%. So hopefully that addresses the, the environmental challenges that you all raised your hands to and gives you the investment opportunity of environmental. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um, so this, from my, from my perspective, so um, when you go back, let's say, in the early 90s, um, there was this question in the room, uh, how can we uh, combine um, economic interests with ecological challenges? And this notion of eco-efficiency popped up. And uh, on the business side, it was the World Business Council for Sustainable Development based in Geneva that promoted this idea of eco-efficiency, resource efficiency. And when I, when I was looking at um, your documents, uh, Alex, I thought this is exactly what's picked up as a fund concept. Huh? So for later on, if we want to remember Alex, it's probably resource or eco-efficiency as a whole concept. Yeah. Um, well, let's move on. Uh, Craig uh, Rees, um, uh, glad, glad to have you here today. Um, and you're from uh, Prestige. Uh, which I would say has a very fundamentally different approach. Please. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so Prestige is uh, 15 years old as a group, and it consists of really three main businesses. The largest business is a renewable energy infrastructure team of um, nearly 70 people up in Cambridge. And essentially, um, our main strategy is around uh, dealing with waste to energy and uh, renewable energy infrastructure. Um, we've been involved in about 50 different renewable energy projects, which amazingly uh, power about 1 million homes in the United Kingdom. And so um, we've built a fairly significant team over the last 15 years to really source and originate that from a, a debt perspective. So we run uh, private market funds. Uh, that are really focused on the debt side of that transaction. And we've been um, really engaging increasingly, not just with fund investors, but with um, very large groups that provide wholesale debt that, that want to collaborate with us in this space going forward. So um, as a group, we have about $1.1 billion of fund assets, but we have about $700 million of non-fund uh, in, in the form of wholesale debt. And all I can say really as an observation is that the um, global pandemic accelerated the whole ESG movement. Mm -hmm. um, and so far it feels like that the war in Ukraine has turbocharged it in so far as the, the level of discussion, the level of interest in the space is uh, you know, really sort of moving to a, a very different level. So that's really what we do. Um, and clearly ESG is an enormous part of that. And recently regulation has played a bigger part of that in Europe with these new rules that have come out called SFDR. Every fund in Europe is desperately trying to upgrade to an Article 8 or an Article 9 fund if they can. Um, and for some that's easier than, than, than others, but... Um, it does represent a, a very significant opportunity going forward. And Th thanks, Rake. Right. Um, yeah, maybe maybe uh, what what's from my point of view is really important to remember here is that you're not doing pure equity. 
you do you go in, in debt finance. So and bear that in mind because I hope I hope later on we will also like Nicole mentioned we will talk a little about uh, the notion of impact. Yeah, and I would argue with those different asset classes we have different impact vehicles. So we will come to that um, later. Yeah, then uh, let's uh, let's move on uh, to uh, Tundra. Uh, and let me introduce Matthias um, Althoff. Uh, and uh, Tundra now is also a um, very specific case, I would argue, since they um, have uh, put a lot of effort into gathering their own data. You know, if you, if you remember back here with uh, what Nicole mentioned, data is a key thing. So therefore, uh, with the um, emerging market focus, I'm happy to hear a little bit more about what you you offer and what your understanding is of ESG. Thank you, Timo. Um, my name is Matthias Althoff. I've been doing emerging markets for over 20 years. Um, for the last nine years at Tundra. Uh, Tundra is a boutique asset manager. We focus on the low income countries and the lower middle income countries according to the World Bank standard. So that means we invest in listed equity in countries like Egypt, uh, Nigeria, Pakistan and Vietnam but also Indonesia and Philippines. Um, from our perspective, it's always been that we need to look at the ESG factors. In our markets, half of the world population lives. They emit a tenth of what we do in the West. If they would reach our level, our emissions would increase three times. That's obviously not sustainable. So we have to make sure that they industrialize in the correct way, in a more efficient way than the, we did. Um, so we look for companies that over time has shown that they can provide a profit for the shareholders, but also that will contribute something good for society in general. And that's also part of what Nicole talked about, that we see less corporate risk attached to that. If their interest is aligned with the society's interest, there are less likely for governments to, to impose unnecessary taxes, but also there's less chances of, of, of uh, re, uh, strange events destruct, destroying value. So for us, uh, ESG is very much incorporated in the analysis process. When we look at companies, we always start by looking at the, the, the ESG factors of the company as well. So we combine that with the financial data to make very sophisticated active management bets. Thanks, Matthias. Um, and maybe what what we should remember for later on is uh, what uh, what I think is very special about your uh, your offer is you gather your own data in in those markets, so you're not basically relying on MSCI and all the other um, offers that are out there. And uh, so I probably. I would assume we will dig into that more in detail because it's very exciting to hear how you do that. We'll be happy to. <laughs> okay, before that, um, we, we, I would like to move on uh, now to our uh, last uh, asset manager. And this is Ulf Freak Hammer. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough name. <laughs> <laughs> well, I asked him before how to pronounce it correctly, but uh, I, I just can't lose, I guess. It's too difficult to say it. It's a Nordic name. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> Free camo. But it's, okay. You did well. Yeah. I will try my best. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, Ulf, um, also um, warm welcome. And please um, elaborate a little bit on what Noron's strategy is in terms of ESG. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting us here. Uh, Noron Asset Management. Uh, I founded the company together with some colleagues uh, 12 years ago. Um, we are uh, an independent asset manager, uh, meaning that we don't have any distribution arm whatsoever connected to us. Uh, uh, so it's very important for us then to have relevant products uh, that are in demand among client base uh, and also that maybe then can produce excess returns, good risk adjusted returns. Uh, we are uh, uh, active managers, uh, we are fundamental, we base our decisions on fundamental research, uh, each company by company. Um, to us, the ESG trends that's been 
very strong in the Nordic area uh, for the last five or six years. It's, uh, it's just an add-on, so to speak, uh, to the investment process uh, that we already do. Uh, it's a natural way of taking the discussion with the company one step further. Um, the way we differentiate might be that we are uh, co-owned by uh, Norway's largest and oldest industrial investment company. It's called Aker Asa. They were the ones that actually um, invested in the Norwegian continental shelf, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pumping up oil. <laughs> And they are now uh, transforming into uh, something very different, uh, but doing that in a controlled way, I would say. So for us, uh, the challenge here is to try to be in front of the curve, what we think at least will shape uh, the inve investment community or financial markets uh, in the coming 10 years. So, have, uh, so if we can have the one foot in the industrial side of the business, the guys that actually build the verticals that needs to be built and one foot in financial markets, I think that might be an edge for us going forward. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ulf. Now, the, 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 the thing is, if you uh, had organized this, this event, let's say, 10 years ago, uh, one typical um, argument in the room would have been uh, ESG, sustainable finance, this is all a niche market. We need to move on, we need to become mainstream. So that was always what people uh, were claiming, um, and uh, so that was kind of the big objective. Now I would argue, and this is also based on Swiss market data, like Stefan mentioned, I'm, I'm involved in writing the uh, market report for Switzerland, which will be launched early next month here in Zurich. Uh, and again, we see huge dynamics there. I can't say more at this point in time, but the, dy the dynamics continue. So we are in the mainstream with this topic, that's for sure. So and since we are in the mainstream, um, it is becoming more and more important for product offers um, um, and for people trying to, to match the interests of the clients to have a unique USP about what you offer in terms of ESG. So that would be my next question for uh, the four of you. Please try to sum up, you know, if you want in some sort of an elevator pitch, why are you the right one with your product for, for in this mainstream ESG community? What is so specific about your product? And uh, yeah, maybe, uh, Alex, please. I'll go again. You go ahead, yeah. Uh, okay, um, so there's two things I think I would point out. Um, and we've already mentioned data, but data is, is a critical to us. We don't buy any third-party data. So we source everything ourselves. So we have a, a research team um, that has built up over the last 13 years a very deep and broad um, environmental disclosure database. And I can promise you that um, the third-party data that is out there is full of errors. And this data is complex. It's unstructured. It does not lend itself well to being scraped. And this is what these guys are doing. They're scraping it. Um, so we, we, we get, collect it, we clean it, we standardize it. And we then understand it. And if we don't understand it, we go and we engage with the company to understand that data. If you want to confidently use the data, you really need to know what it, what it means, what it's representing. And that's exactly what we do. We also engage with companies to, to drive further disclosure, so better disclosure. Um, and those companies that don't disclose yet, and you know, we're looking at a sort of MSCI world type basket, only half of that universe is actually disclosing the three metrics that we require. So there's a huge gap there. So we are engaging with these companies to put the data there, show it, you know, be, be relative to your peers. Um, and, and hopefully as we you know, go on, this, we'll, we'll be able to talk more about the next 10 years and what we hope for. Uh, the second thing I'd, I'd really focus on is the signal itself. We, we have one signal. It's a very pure signal. It's uncorrelated with other traditional investment factors. So it's great that you can, um, you can either use it to replace existing passive exposures with you know, huge reduction in carbon footprinting and this potential outperformance that we see in our funds. Um, or you can sit it alongside 
your existing exposures, because it will not dilute, it will not conflict with um, existing you know, traditional investment factors. Um, so I see those two things as, as very much our differentiating factors in our USPs. Thanks, Alex. I think uh, very good points. Um, Greg, and over to you. Do you have a mic? Yeah. Okay. So from our perspective, I think we genuinely add value to an investor portfolio um, because we can clearly demonstrate that we deliver an impact for an investor. Um, one of the big things that we focus on is um, renewable energy infrastructure, but specifically around waste energy. Now, the UK, for example, puts 10 million tonnes worth of food waste into landfill every year. So they dig a hole in the ground. And over the next few years, digging a hole in the ground is going to get banned by the government in its quest for carbon neutrality, net zero, and, and everything else. So historically, Europe has dealt with its waste in a number of different ways, but one of them is dig a hole in the ground, mm -hmm. another one is burn it, and another one is send it on a boat to China. And all of that's going to stop. So um, with a country of 68 million people and maybe as much as 1,000 people a day arriving in the UK, um, the problem is getting bigger, not, not smaller. And the other critical element here is that Whenever you hear about the environment, everyone talks about carbon. Carbon is the thing. But actually, methane is a quarter of global warming. And it's 25 times more toxic than carbon emissions. So you're going to see a lot more government policy and cooperation over the next few years around methane emissions and how you can capture that and do something better than just digging a hole in the ground and letting it escape in, into the atmosphere. So a lot of what we do is around um, biogas, and so um, there's about 600 biogas plants in the United Kingdom. Um, there's plans for potentially hundreds more. And they do some interesting things because the first thing they do is they generate gas, which clearly right now every country in Europe is looking for ways to source gas from anywhere but Russia. So if you can make your own gas, that's great. Under the UK's climate change commitment to be carbon neutral by 2050, 20% of its gas must come from renewable sources. So that's clearly a, a, a positive. But the second thing that they do is that they sometimes generate electricity. Well, um, the sale of petrol and diesel cars is going to stop in nine years' time in the UK. The relevance of that is that the UK has approximately 40 million cars. So if they're all going to be powered by electricity in 10 years' time, instead of petrol and diesel, we're going to need a lot more electricity, clearly. And then there's some other elements here. Um, the biogas plants that we get involved with also produce a nitrate-rich digestate, which is an alternative to fertilizer. Now, Russia is the world's fourth biggest producer of fertilizer. China is the number one. And the problem is that fertilizer prices are at a record high at the moment, and they're priced in US dollars. So you have a double whammy if you're a farmer, and it's the single biggest cost in a farm is fertilizer, often, that not only has it gone up massively because of the war, but it's also gone up because it's the dollar strength versus the pound or the euro or, or other currencies. But it's a much more fundamental point here, and that is that um, farming, for example, which is a big part of our customer base, is under enormous pressure to change. Because on the one hand, groups like the United Nations are telling governments around the world that there could be three billion more people on planet Earth over the next 30 years. And we may need to produce 50% more food every day than we currently produce. And the price of food is going through the roof as we've got this massive spike in inflation. So produce more. But then there's the other side, and that is that farming is often the world's second largest polluter. So how do you reconcile produce 50% more mm -hmm. but don't pollute when you're already the world's second biggest polluter and a time when you've got enormous stress on input costs such as energy, grain, fertiliser and all these other things that we all take for granted that suddenly have become a, a major thing. So... Um, 
the biogas plants that we get involved with, that we finance, sometimes we own, sometimes we operate, um, produce sometimes gas, electricity, and fertilizer. And there's one other thing. Some of them can actually be upgraded to capture CO2, which we then bottle and containerize and sell back to the food industries, which use a lot of CO2 in food production and in um, food processing, and also the medical industries. So suddenly we've got something that does a number of different solutions uh, across the, the, the spectrum. But the key element here is that as virtuous and mainstream as wind and solar are, and 45% of our energy mix comes from wind and solar these days, they don't address that critical issue of what do you do with 68 million people's waste every day if you can't burn it, dig a hole in the ground, or send it on a boat? Right. So, yeah, what's to think about? Thanks, Rake. Um, so I, I definitely see that um, you first think about where should our money go and where is it urgently needed. So, uh, yeah, um, please, Matthias, uh, Tundra, what would you say? The USP? Yeah, I, I think we take a longer approach to this that, um, as I mentioned about the emissions that we release compared to, to half of the global population in the world. And when you consider that all new available workforce will be born in Southeast Asia or in Africa, in the markets we invest, it becomes much more important that we do it right there than the 60 million uh, in the UK. Uh, longer term. That doesn't mean that we need to, we, we can skip, to, you know, fixing the UK as well. But for us, it, it's a longer term approach. And um, I think what we need to do is push the companies we invest in to become more uh, transparent and get more data uh, in these different areas. We, we certainly have a problem with the lack of data. We, we also you know, use the, the global providers of ESG screening, um, but we find more data than they do. So we rely much more on our internal data for uh, how much they, you know, um, carbon emissions or workforce um, turnover or whatever it is. Uh, it's very important for us to be in contact with local NGOs, uh, the stock exchange, the companies themselves, to push them to higher the level, uh, the level, standard level of the whole country, as well as the corporate themselves. Um, and that's really uh, what we feel is, is really important for the longer term um, right. growth in the market. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Oof. yeah. Well, I think it's uh, important to try to look ahead. What will shape uh, markets uh, going forward, as we should have done maybe the last 10 years, uh, which was shaped by central banks and the ambition to keep interest rates low or negative? What effect did that have on multiples, for instance, on, on risk assets? In the same way, uh, I believe that uh, whether they are reliable, credible or whatever, the plans that Europe has uh, for decarbonizing the economy uh, and reaching the goals by 2030 and 2050, I think they will, have, they will honestly absolutely give it a shot. Uh, it's going to be a wall of capex, uh, really capital intense, and now also propelled by uh, the events in Ukraine, so they will front load uh, capex. What will that mean for financial markets at the same time as we've underinvested uh, in energy uh, since 2015? We've lost the equivalent of half an OPEC in reserve lives uh, in the world's um, see, uh, uh, oil reserves. So the baseline where we start from is that we're already short of energy, obviously. Uh, so a wall of capex uh, in 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 uh, uh, in adding energy and, and also uh, shifting the energy mix. And uh, I mean uh, the lessons we've learned from history is um, you need to be able to avoid the crowding effects that can happen where people pile into the same ideas. So my job uh, as being active in the listed markets 
I mean, I won't invest if I don't think the project is attractive. I won't invest if my industrial partners say that the counterpart is not reliable. I'm, I'm not investing. So you need to have um, a fundamental backstop, uh, I would say. And also you need to have a balanced portfolio. It's really easy that you expose yourself without knowing it to, to one factor. Uh, growth or momentum or whatever, you need to have a balanced portfolio, uh, even uh, from an ESG perspective. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, it's going to be difficult. Um, uh, I think, yeah. I mean, we only do the, do the Nordics. We've been doing it for 30 years. We kind of know the companies um, and the management teams. Uh, and I think that will be a plus as well uh, going forward. Thank you, Ulf. Yeah, thanks to all of you. Um, I think what we got now is a full picture of different approaches, which all make sense in a different way. And now if we step back for a second and put our shoes into the, uh, you know, uh, into the um, perspective of an investor, uh, the question is, where would you invest? And therefore, I'm very happy to uh, introduce now an actual investor, Dominic Becht, uh, and he, he's um, from, from a uh, pension fund, Abendbrot. When, when I first ho heard it, I ho thought it was Abendbrot, but uh, of course this is not right, Rot, Abendbrot. Uh, yeah, and um, I'm very happy, to Dominic, to have you here on the panel today, because uh, for those of you who are not that familiar with Abendbrot, um, the, the, at the DNA is sustainable investing. So the main idea, the foundation when Abendroth was founded was to offer a product um, um, for, for you know, in, um, uh, insurances, for, for pension funds, uh, with the focus of sustainable investment. So therefore, my question to you now, as a potential client, or I heard even actual client, uh, wh where would you invest and what, what is it that you find inspiring, interesting, new, and but what, what where, where would you also maybe have additional questions to understand better what's going on? Okay, many thanks. I mean, just maybe to, to take up the Abendroth kind of saying, it's not a sunset industry, which is uh, hopefully uh, the case for our pension fund as well. Um, we also not experts, maybe. I, I just want to set the stage a bit. We are a pension fund, so we have to produce returns for our beneficiaries. So that's a prime obligation of a pension fund, uh, but, and I would maybe refer to what Nicole has said, we did a bit our homework, and that's why we are sort of, in our DNA, we have Im Im implied already the, um, the sustainability focus from the beginning in 1984. So we are clearly value-based. We are, we are value-based uh, investor in, in terms of sustainability. Um, what we have asked ourselves uh, with this wave of, of uh, ESG coming to us in the last few years is how do we dis make, make a distinction or how, or how can we preserve our USP as one of the leading or beginning uh, well, original investors in, in ESG? And we have come up with the notion of impact. So I want to pay, maybe also explain a bit on that side, impact, what does impact mean and how can we actually classify uh, impact? We came up with this tool that is called uh, the Impact Management Project, um, which defines actually for investors two dimensions of impact. One impact is what the funds are actually impacting to the world or the companies we invest in. What kind of impact do they have on the world? We have heard some of the impacts that, that are out there, for example, the Craig's uh, fund. Um, and then the second dimension is what do I as an investor or we as investors, what kind of impact can we have on those uh, companies, funds or, or whatsoever. And I think what, what we as a pension fund did now, we have classified all our asset classes in, in which we, we are invested in that matrix. And when you do that, you actually find that in the liquid space, your contribution as an investor is actually not very meaningful. You can actually do some engagement, maybe with some of the funds, 
that are uh, present here, or you can basically vote in a company if you think that they, they do well or they don't do well. But that's limited to these two aspects of, of uh, investor contribution and the impact. All the other impacts can only come in the illiquid space. So your capital only makes a difference in illiquid space. That's where I have an impact as an investor if I give money to people that uh, actually need my money. If I invest in Nestle, they don't need my money. I buy it from you and you sell it to someone else. So the impact as an investor in liquid space is limited. In illiquid areas, it's, it's much more broader in a sense. And then obviously you have to look at the other dimension and that's maybe where I can sort of you know, comment a bit on, on what we have seen so far. Um, the, the impact management project defines basically three uh, distinct dimensions. It says basically there's an A dimension where people just want to do no harm. Uh, it's a bit the Google slogan, but uh, that's the value, the exclusion approach where you say, okay, we don't own this or that, we have some values, um, but that's about it. Um, I see that maybe a bit more in the in the neuron space where we have uh, yeah, we have certain exclusions, but uh, you know that's about it. Um, then we have the B segment where you actually want to to contribute positively by uh, maybe uh, you know avoiding uh, bad worse companies in, in certain sectors, you buy the best in class type of companies, you try to focus on people who do a bit more resource efficient behavior, who contribute in that sense and have some impact to some stakeholders and to, to some uh, targets. Uh, I would see maybe Osmosis as a, a contributor in that B space if you want. Uh, maybe also Tundra to some extent because they, they focus on, on areas where best practice examples are needed, where engagement is possible with, with companies. And then we have the C space where actual solutions to actual problems are funded specifically. And I would maybe classify uh, prestige or say the biogas ideas he has. That's actually money going to, to fund problems that need uh, capital and where uh, the, the capital provided is actually helping uh, to solve, uh, in this case, uh, energy problems. So that's how I would go about uh, organizing, say, the, uh, uh, the framework as an investor, and then uh, according to my own kind of values and my impact uh, focus, I would then uh, choose the, the funds I think are, I need to, to have in my portfolio. Okay. Thanks, uh, Dominic, for this sharing your views as an uh, investor on uh, what we uh, have been uh, heard before. Uh, and before I give you the opportunity maybe to reflect on what he, his perception, uh, I would like to introduce the last uh, person on the panel, Ingeborg Schumacher. Um, uh, and uh, Inge and I, we um, have been known each other for at least, I don't know, 20, 25 years, something like that. Uh, she's very active uh, in Zurich and in Switzerland, um, nowadays, she's working as an ESG expert, but she also worked for UBS um, in the asset management team. So therefore, Inge, um, also welcome on the panel. And I would like to hand over to you, maybe from your perspective and your, your long experiences with, I mean, how the ESG market evolved. And now we, we have seen uh, four different approaches here on the panel. What would you, what, what's your reflection on what, you, what you've heard so far? Is it, um, do you think something needs to be added or do you, something was missing or do you think it's uh, perfect products? Inge. Well, um, can you take the, the uh, microphone? Yes, please. So, yes, it's, uh, it's a challenge for me now to judge what is perfect. Uh, um, my intention was to ask another specific question or one general and uh, one specific questions to, to the panelists. So, and uh, interesting enough, so I was also referring to the concept that Nicole just mentioned, and I think it's very, very important to see the differentiation about the different objectives that should be achieved by sustainable investing. First, materiality, then value alignment, and impact. And I wonder if it's possible for you as a panelist to just categorize your approach in one of two, one of these boxes, or are there more boxes? And if you could just add two remarks, why this box? Or what's the proof why you fit there? 
So this would be a general, and then I have some specific to each of you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, maybe for those of you who are not familiar with what Inge just mentioned, or, the, or also Nicole, these three motivations. Um, there was just recently um, a report published by AMAS and Swiss Sustainable Finance, where they discussed those three motivations in detail. So it's, it's free of, of download, a PDF, so if you haven't had a look at it, I think it's a very nice report. Yes, please, but then I hand over to our uh, product offerers. So as you've seen, impact apparently is an important aspect, and uh, I don't know who um, would like to go um, first and uh, comment on you know, the specifics uh, um, perspective of uh, um, your product, your fund on the impact notion. Yes, Ulf, yeah, please. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we, first of all, we offer both uh, Article 8 and 9 funds, and uh, we try to fully, obviously, comply with all the regulations uh, attached to representing an Article 9 fund. Uh, uh, but I mean, um, where, where I feel that we, I mean, I, I agree with uh, the, uh, the speaker here from the pension fund that uh, where you make the most different differences, obviously, uh, with, with uh, people that really needs your money uh, rather than buying uh, an established liquid company. I mean, but for smaller companies in our region, uh, it's really hard to... Um, in front of the curve with all the upcoming regulations. So we've had workshops. Uh, I don't know whether this is defined as impact or not. It's, it's knowledge transfer, I guess, from us to smaller companies uh, in, in the way they should um, present uh, themselves uh, and, and maybe also discuss, uh, have a discussion about future investments uh, in order to get, uh, obviously, I mean, the best type of valuation from the equity side and the, the best uh, cost of capital. Uh, uh, so we've had workshops with, with smaller companies. I wouldn't call that impact, maybe. I don't know if that's impact. It's, I mean, if you're an active investor, you, you, you are used to having discussions all the time with companies and the ESG and, the, uh, and everything surrounding that is just another topic for us actually. Uh, yeah. uh. May I just, sorry, may I just add my second question is, is if it's uh, really good. So you talked about transformation. Um, I think it's uh, really interesting to see that there are companies in transformation and we know about the sustainable development goals, we know about the climate targets, but okay, the, the companies need to really produce products and services in the market. So how are you able to support uh, companies in, in this transformation process? Which role do you have as investor? Yeah, thanks for the second question. And, uh, and Can you briefly? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there is lo lots of sort of, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't overplay our role in transformation. We are a small uh, independent player, but I mean, uh, it is important that established companies, for instance, the Nordics are, are big on steel production and stuff like that, very carbon intensive projects. So there is large uh, projects with decarbonizing de steel production. Of course, institutional investors can be there to fund those projects, um, if, if that's one example of the company transforming. If, if I may talk about uh, the Norwegian company that uh, owns uh, part of our company. Uh, three years ago, they, have, uh, they had only uh, oil production on the Norwegian continental shelf. That, that was the main dri driver of that company. Obviously, we've been uh, having discussions with them. Now they've established four uh, renewable verticals, uh, carbon capture, uh, offshore wind and and um, uh, 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 and uh, hydrogen projects as well. Uh, so so uh, they are lots of, uh, of companies uh, incumbents are transforming and, and we can we we can be a positive catalyst. But I mean, given the size that we have compared to the size that they are and the capital intensity 
of those projects, we, we can play a rather small role, uh, to be honest, uh, in that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I mean, you, you asked the question, can workshops be uh, related to impact investments? I would argue, yes, of course. If, if, you, if you raise awareness and companies based on these new insights change their strategy, that can be very impactful. Uh, yeah, but this, this then is kind of the condition, right? Uh, just coffee drinking won't work. <laughs> uh, yes, um, maybe then, Matthias, what, what would you say? What, what, where, where do where's Tundra having the most impactful um, approach? Um, I, I think our constant communication with the companies are, uh, is what's driving part of the change we see in, in the markets uh, we operate in, or not operate, but invest in. Uh, we've had uh, investor forum days together with the stock exchange in Vietnam, with the stock exchange in Sri Lanka, and with the stock exchange in Pakistan, where we attend, where we invite NGOs, where we invite the corporates to tell them about the importance of these aspects. Uh, and that definitely helps raise awareness. We also push the companies quite hard that they need to disclose more of what they do. Um, I usually tell an example of an Egyptian uh, industrial conglomerate that we met with and we were kind of campaigning at them that you don't do enough. And they told me, like, we have actually a university where we educate uh, engineers. And that's how we actually make sure that we have a supply of engineers for the company. But they didn't tell anyone anywhere. So we, we started pushing them, and now it's on the web page. It's actually they have a whole ESG section. It's not only on our, you know, on our efforts, but we 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 need to raise the awareness and the importance of all these questions and aspects. And by communicating with the companies and helping them uh, in certain aspects as well, that okay, company X in country Y did this. Maybe you can do that as well. Also brings up the level uh, in general. Um, but we also find that these, these boxes uh, is very difficult for us because there's a, a huge lack of data. So when you talk about different gradings for, for Article 8 or the Article 9 or Morning Stars, Globes, it doesn't really work on us because no one has enough data for the companies we invest in. So we rarely fit in the box. We, we're always outside and we have to spend time uh, educating investors on how we think and what we do and why that matters and why the corporates we invest in are really good companies to invest in. Um, and over time, we have uh, you know, shown sub uh, substantial um, uh, performance. So, so it's, it's not a performance issue. It's more that it needs a lot of explaining that what we do is actually something good as well. Yeah. Um, and maybe then, uh, Alex, we jump to you, because if I may use Dominic's classification scheme, you also obtained the B in the impact category. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, therefore, um, would be curious to hear your response. Where do you think you have the most impact on in the, in the real world? Um, so I would say we are very much uh, an environmental expert. So environmental impact is one of our main drivers. In fact, our only driver is sustainability. Um, so, and again, to Nicole's um, points as well, I would say that um, on an, eth an ethics-based, a values-based, you know, you're doing the right thing. You're investing in companies that are more sustainable for the future. Um, materiality, we are outperforming the market, so you're getting a better return. Um, and then, you know, to Dominic's point, um, yes, we, you are getting reduction. You are getting reduction in, in your, uh, your portfolios. However, you are also impacting significantly on the, on the environmental front. So the, um, the, the footprint that I mentioned, the carbon footprint for investors in, in equities, can be dramatically reduced um, by investing in this fashion. And you know, equities are a large portion of most, most people's investments. So that is a significant part of, of our process and what we offer to, um, to our investors. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, then. Oh, could I, sorry, can I just answer one more thing? Yeah. So just to the point Inga made on transformation. Okay, uh, transformation, yeah. Yeah, I know, no one's picked this up yet, probably. Uh, so transformation. So in, in one of our funds, we run ex-fossil fuels. Um, 
And so we exclude companies that have revenues coming from oil and gas, from thermal coal, um, nuclear, from oil sands ties. But we reward those companies that are moving to transition. So they are, they are on the pathway to transition. So they are converting their businesses from dirty to, to clean, so renewables. So we look at the, um, the generation capacity in, the, in their mix. So this is mainly utility businesses. We look at that generation capacity, and anyone who's producing over 50% of their gener generating capacity from renewables is allowed back into our portfolio. So we're really trying to aid that transition and you know, help these companies with effectively right. with, with funding and, okay. and buying the shares. Um, Craig, from, um, from a pure impact generation point of view, um, uh, one could argue there are two basic mechanisms, active ownership, why thus um, providing additional capital for solutions? And I think clearly what you guys are doing is the latter, right? So therefore, I would say the, the impact question is kind of obvious. But if we go back to Inge's point with transformation, transition, so contributing to the big challenges that we have, and if I may challenge you a bit, uh, is that kind of, is that enough what you do? Is that, uh, is it a tiny little piece of the transformation or do we need to scale that up? What would you say? Sure. Um, there's a lot of transition at the moment and you, you maybe look at it from this context. Um, there's six million companies in the UK. 99.9% .9 of them are private companies. They're not listed on the stock exchange. So none of these guys can buy their shares. So how do you get 99.9% .9 of the companies that employ 90% of the workforce, they are the backbone of the economy, to decarbonize and to become more ESG in the way that they operate? And remember, most of those companies can't get a bank loan. So the traditional lending channels, the traditional finance doesn't exist to them. They can't go to the stock market. They can't go to a bank. So how do they get capital into their business and how do you shape them? Now, the blunt instrument is that the government will issue new rules and regulations around net zero and carbon neutrality and so forth. But there's a role to play for the private market industry, be it private equity or private debt. Now, from a prestige perspective, 10 years ago, we were just a lender. We would just give the money to a company. And sometimes that was incredibly successful, and other times it was clearly not. But these days, we have a 40-person strong infrastructure business that goes out to the community of our customer base and consults with them and designs for them and educates them about what they need to do to reduce their costs, reduce their pollution, and maybe if you do this and that, you may get actually a profit right. boost. So that transition is really at two levels. It's about educating the small business. And remember, most small businesses are really just trying to get to the end of the month and make the payroll in an environment where you've got 9% inflation. Whereas now it's sort of looking at it from, from the other perspective of us as a group are transforming, but the whole industry is transforming, partly by happenstance. The pandemic changed the world. The war changed the world. Inflation is now a, a key element to everybody trying to get efficiency. So these kind of things are, are where we focus on, and it has been transformatory in the way we operate as a business because we don't really lend money anymore in the traditional sense. Right. We deliver a solution for the customer. 